Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna hold on a minute while our platform is letting everyone in. But in the meantime, feel free to use the chat to give us a greeting, say hello, let us know where you're tuning in from today. We would love to hear from you and um, see where you're joining us from. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining everyone. We're just holding off while our platforms, letting everyone in. As you join, you'll notice that you're automatically muted. Your cameras are automatically off. It will stay that way throughout today's session, um, but we encourage you to use the chat to add questions, comments, resources, and um, right now, go ahead and give us a greeting and let us know where you're coming from. I see those coming in and it looks like we have folks from all over today. Welcome, welcome. Is always one of my favorite parts is to see where you all are joining from. I know all of us are in different spots today. I am joining from um, Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So shout out to all my Midwest people. All right, well, it looks like our numbers are starting to level off. So we're gonna go ahead and get started because we have a great discussion ahead for you all today. Um, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, The Distorted Mirror Technology's Impact on Youth Body Image. My name's Jackie Zimmerman, and I'm the Manager of Public Education Partnerships and E-Learning for MHA, and I'll be moderating today's panel discussion. I have just a few notes for you all before I introduce our speakers. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed out to all registrants within one week. We currently do not offer CEUs, but we do provide certificates of attendance. So I'll post the link shortly in the chat where you can um, request one of those certificates. And that will also be included in your follow-up materials. Right now we're at that back to school time where many youth and young adults are preparing or already going back to school which means at MHA, we're really focusing our content and education on youth-focused topics. This year, our Back to School Toolkit and information will be released, and the focus is on youth and technology use and how technology impacts youth mental health. The toolkit that comes out will dive into topics like what types of content youth are consuming, um, how parents and adults can take steps to protect youth and mental health from online harms, how to encourage positive use of social media and technology, and um, what online communities can benefit people. We'll also focus on how um, social media can impact youth body image and self-esteem, which is really what our focus will be for the next hour together. Today we'll be discussing how social media impacts um, and influences body image and self-confidence of youth and young adults. Topics today addressed will be things like disordered eating, body dysmorphia and additional mental health conditions. So please, if any content is triggering or harmful for you at the time, please take time to step away, do what you need to do and take care of yourself. This conversation is being recorded so you can always come back to it and listen later. Um, please just, we encourage you to, to take care of yourself during this time. And now I am pleased to um, introduce our lovely speakers we have joining us here today. Um, we have four amazing panelists. First with us is Lisa Bradzek, who's the executive director at Withall, where she leads strategic growth as sustainable social enterprise dedicated to the prevention of and healing from eating disorders. Lisa has more than 20 years of experience in public affairs, community relations, and law, and over 15 years of experience in nonprofit leadership. She lived with disordered eating during childhood, which evolved into a clinical eating disorder. Lisa has been in recovery for over two decades, finding peace, appreciation, and joy with her body and food, some days easier than others. Lisa does this work because she knows kids are not born with eating disorders, and eating disorders are not inevitable. She also feels strongly that everyone struggling with food and body deserves recovery. Welcome, Lisa. With us today, we also have Serena Nankia, 
Welch, who is a body activist, longtime advocate for eating disorder recovery, and senior marketing and communications manager for an eating disorder nonprofit called Project Heal. She spent close to a decade building expertise on the way body image, media, and eating disorders affect people's daily lives, as well as how fat phobia and weight stigma create issues of access and discrimination systemically and interpersonally. Serena's inspiration comes from her sister, Ellen, who struggled with an eating disorder for over a decade and is now in long-term recovery. Welcome, Serena. We also have Stephanie Elvers, who is the Clinical Assessment Program Manager at Project HEAL. Stephanie's worked in counseling and higher education for 15 years with focus on creating access to education for individuals with marginalized identities. Stephanie believes that we are truly better together and healing becomes possible when we listen to the experiences of all bodies dealing with eating disorders. She maintains a clinical mental health license in the states of Nebraska, Iowa, and Idaho. She is also a B body positive trained facilitator. Stephanie holds a doctoral degree in development, developmental psychology and a master's in community mental health counseling. Welcome, Stephanie. And last uh, but not least, we have Sophie Zhu, who is a Los Angeles born mental health activist, writer, and public speaker. She was a youth leader at MTV's Mental Health Youth Action Forum at the White House, where she shared her story with President Biden and helped guide the administration on how to best serve the needs of youth in the mental health care system. Sophie is also a three time intern at the US House of Representatives and an internationally recognized poet, winning the 2021 Marilla Poetry Prize and serving as an inaugural poet for LA Mayor Karen Bass. They have advised numerous organizations, including Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation, Mental Health America, and the California Mental Health Consortium. As a first year student at Stanford University, they hope to double major in American studies with a concentration in mental health care justice and comparative studies in race and ethnicity, with two minors in human rights and creative writing. As an eating disorder survivor and proud Jewish Latina, Sophie combines their own experiences with injustice brought about by mental health care inequity with her passion for writing, advocacy, and leadership to uplift the voices of those with lived experiences and fight the systemic destigmatization of marginalized bodies. Welcome, Sophie. Speakers, I am so happy each of you could join us here today for this very important conversation and timely conversation. Um, and I know we just heard some absolutely incredible bios describing each of you, but I would love if um, we could just start out by each of you introducing yourself um, a little bit about the, the work you do in this area and any experiences you've had personally or professionally around this topic we have today. I can go first. Um, I just want to say it's such a privilege to share space with everyone. And I think that one thing that really resonates with me hearing everybody's story is the proximity to lived experience in this space. And I thank you all for channeling that lived experience into such tangible, real, and important change. Um, so my passion for eating disorder advocacy and social media advocacy definitely comes from a place of lived experience as well. Um, when I was 10 years old, I first downloaded Instagram because everyone around me had done so as well and was almost immediately bombarded with content that not only promoted dieting and thin bodies, but quite frankly promoted super dangerous eating disorder behavior. It's an unregulated space and unfortunately so many young people are exposed to content that is blatantly and knowingly harmful. Um, and that led me down a very dangerous path. And by the time I was 15, I had to look my doctor in the eyes as he told me I had about two weeks left to live, but there was nothing the hospital could do for me because my BMI was quote unquote normal. And therefore I wasn't considered someone with an eating disorder. Um, there are far too many stories like mine. There are far too many young people who fall into a system that doesn't recognize that body sizes are different. We're not all meant to be thin. Um, so I just feel very lucky to be able to have survived and beat the odds and to be doing this work. And that's why I share my story and why I'm so grateful to all of you for doing the same and for uplifting the voices of especially young people um, who are facing this right now because 
because they are completely unprotected in a new unregulated space that is social media, um, that is the digital sphere that didn't exist 10 years ago. So um, yeah, I feel very lucky to be here and just very excited to dive into this conversation. You can go ahead and go next. My name is Lisa Radzak. Thank you, Sophie, for that. And it's really a privilege to be with you as well. Serena, Stephanie, and Jackie, always good to see you and be with you. I have the privilege of leading with all as we work nationwide to equip adult role models in particular with awareness and tools for supporting young people's healthy body image, positive relationship with food, and also for how we can put some of these things into practice in really tangible ways as we're working to support kids' health. Um, our, our mission is really to help young people feel good in their bodies. And one of the examples of some of the resources we provide um, is a parent's guide to social media, which is a nice primer for what can feel for some of us um, that are a little bit older, just sort of how to ground yourself into some of these things that are important, I believe, for us adult role models that are supporting kids to be aware of. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, such a, a wonderful pleasure to be among these uh, these lovely people. Um, again, I'm Serena Nangia. I am the Senior Marketing Communications Manager at Project Heal. Project Heal is a national nonprofit that is focused on providing an, uh, access to equitable health care for eating disorders. So what that can look like is a lot of people can't afford treatment or um, might not know if they have any disorder because they haven't gotten a diagnosis or they need help navigating their insurance because insurance is really confusing, um, especially when it comes to eating disorder care. So um, we help people navigate those situations. We help people um, and, and help them access care for free or very low cost. Um, so I definitely recommend if you or anyone you know needs support uh, to apply on our website, and I'll put that in, link in the chat soon. Um, my personal experience uh, and professional experience is that I um, was raised in kind of the middle between I had we had social media, but it wasn't as popular as it is now. Um, and I was sheltered from it a lot because my parents were worried about all of this stuff. Um, and, and it was helpful for some parts. And I also, um, as I joined social media, as I went into um, my last years of high school and then college, um, I found real community um, and found a lot of positive aspects of social media. And as I have been working in the eating disorder space for um, as, as an advocate in high school and then um, for the past many years, I also see the, the, you know, the real negative impacts and the financial benefit that um, that social media companies uh, and conglomerates are getting from pro anorexia pro eating disorder content, which we can talk about more. Um, so I come from a very uh, you know, I do social media for a living, I do marketing for a living, and I see firsthand uh, through my own advocacy as well online, how, um, how really harmful and triggering um, and, and mean people can be. And I, as a professional, as well as an advocate, have to navigate those spaces and find ways to stay involved because it's my job and then also to protect myself. And so that's been definitely um, a really hard journey and continues to be, but that is where I'm coming from. So thank you for having me. And uh, my name is Stephanie Albers. I'm the Clinical Assessment Program Manager at Project Heal. I'm also grateful to be in this space with everyone here today. Um, I myself am in mental health and eating disorder uh, recovery. Um, and social media has actually been very helpful in that recovery once I kind of learned to curate it and uh, block out, you know, what was what was unhelpful. Um, in my graduate work uh, in developmental psychology, the focus of my study was on uh, peer relationships, disordered eating, social media use, and mental health. And so this topic is very near and dear to my heart. And having two young sons trying to navigate um, the social media landscape between being an alert user versus not 
having traumatic experiences online, trying to balance the, their social media use is, is always on the forefront of my mind as well. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Sophie, Serena, and Lisa. Um, we're so grateful to have you all here, and I appreciate your willingness to, to be open and share. And as someone who is here in a moderator role today, I'm also someone that comes to this um, discussion with my own lived experience with an eating disorder and recovery and anxiety and um, a variety of mental health conditions. So it's a topic near and dear to, to all of us. And as I see you all in the chat, I appreciate everyone who's sharing in there as well. Um, we're just sending, sending all the love to everyone in these conversations as they're so important, they can challenge us um, personally and professionally. So thank you all for being here today and being open to our conversation. Um, I wanna kind of, kind of dive into how you've seen the, the real impacts of um, technology on youth mental health. And we know for young people, just being in your adolescent years is hard enough. There are so many challenges that come with growing up and finding your identity and um, all the things that, that come with adolescence. But when we're adding this technology and social media, it's a whole extra layer that can really be another challenge for mental health. Um, there's constant, you know, access to scroll on your phone and see pictures of influencers and a new recipe and a new fad diet and a new celebrity in a, in a different bikini that, you know, kids are constantly and adults consuming. Um, but it's so, so hard to, to really know how all of that is truly affecting the mental health of young people. And so for all of you who are working in these areas, I'd love to just hear um, how you see the effects of social media um, impacting youth mental health and more specifically that disordered eating and, and body dysmorphia. I think what I see a lot of times with folks is when people engage in online in, in, in any kind of content, but in particular uh, appearance and diet related content, um, they're engaging in upward social comparison. Like they are trying to decide how they measure up to the standards um, that are being presented to them. Adults do this as well. We see pictures of people's houses, their perfectly cooked meals. Um, and so this upward social comparison translates into many things, um, but it can be particularly uh, focused on in eating and, and weight and behaviors. Um, and if you were going to social media with the idea that you wanted to escape or connect or were already kind of feeling down, um, this is going to inevitably uh, make you feel worse. Um, and if you didn't have those thoughts to begin with, I wouldn't say that you are immune from also engaging in that upward social comparison. It's just if you're already kind of in a negative space, it's going to kind of add, add to that. Yeah, I fully agree. Social media capitalizes on young people being in a negative headspace. Um, I'm currently the director of mental health and well-being for the undergraduate population at Stanford, and it's kind of turned to me and telling me about their experience with social media, their experience with just mental health challenges in general. And a lot of what I hear over and over again is that young people feel at fault for the content that they're viewing being um, harmful. They feel like, oh, I am inherently flawed. There is something wrong with me. Therefore, the algorithm is spitting harmful content at me. Um, but we've learned time and time again that this is not true, that social media platforms profit off of young people seeing triggering content because triggering content is addictive. Um, I could definitely drop the link to the study in the chat, but there's recently a study done by the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Um, and in that study, they created a profile with a vulnerable username. It included the words lose weight. Um, and that username was 12 times more likely to um, be delivered content that directly promoted eating disorders that was pro-anorexia, pro-bulimia, pro-eating disorder content. Um, and on average, across all of the different usernames that they tested, I think it was about 30 something seconds until a negative body image or negative um, food 
behavior related post came across the page. So this is kind of happening consistently, uh, but the social media platforms do capitalize off of young people being vulnerable. Uh, they do profit off of that. And it's something that these social media platforms have admitted to themselves. So that is kind of the biggest thing that I see overall is this narrative being pushed that young people are at fault for this content. This kind of moral panic that I'd say is coming a lot of times from older adults kind of saying like, oh, young people these days, you know, uh, they're looking at harmful content. There's seeking out harmful content, they're posting harmful content, they're spewing out misinformation, but it's really this misinformation and this harmful content that is being pushed by the platforms. So a lot of the work that a lot of young people are trying to do today is kind of flip this narrative and make sure that we intentionally center and hold these social media platforms accountable for the harms that they're causing to young people. I just want to add from a in agreement, wholehearted agreement with with what um, Stephanie and Sophia have shared. Uh, if we if we back up a bit and we just think about you know what what causes eating disorders, what contributes to disordered eating, um, we know that it's often broken down into the factors that contribute are broken into bio, biology, psychology, so, so social um, environment, right? And so we don't know what factors any given uh, young person has in the, no one's wearing a sign around that says you know i'm predisposed to uh, disordered eating or eating disorders um, but we know that the environment that a young person is their brain is literally growing in is is such a huge factor to be aware of as we are the adults role models their you know their leaders their support um, and to be aware of when when a, a young person is exposed so heavily to really harmful messages that prioritize appearance and further and promote diet culture um, for those young people, again, we don't know who they are. It's it's pouring gas on on a fire um, that we that we simply have to be aware of and get our hands around because we we can't have our kids in these situations. Absolutely. And I think part of that is thinking about the narrative that these that the stories are telling online and how we can counteract that narrative. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the positives of social media. But I do want to emphasize some of the stuff that Sophie said, just with some statistics, um, additional statistics. So um, Meta, uh, that owns Instagram and Facebook, um, in 20, the end of 2021, there was a staff member who uh, whistle blew the organization and told everybody that um, Meta knew fully that they were um, perpetuating pro-eating disorder content and that they were making money off of it. So based solely on Instagram, um, Instagram profits more than $230 million a year from pro-eating disorder content. And um, that includes more than uh, $62 million a year from underage pro-eating disorder content. So pro-eating disorder content sent specifically to people who are under 18, who um, in reality, we haven't taught or given them the tools um, and they haven't had time to develop them to, um, to completely, uh, you know, process those those that pro uh, eating disorder content um and i think a lot about that ex and and that you know when it comes to how the companies are making um that money i really i think it's important to understand that like sophie said they make money off of triggering content and part of that is because you spend more time on this on the app when um you are you are incited to feel something um and i think as someone who didn't grow up with TikTok, um and uh but very much use twitter and instagram now um TikTok is a little bit of um it's a little scary for me as someone who's like a young person but not young enough like i don't understand it my um the algorithm is really weird and and i would say specifically for TikTok, the algorithm and the pro eating disorder content seems to be 
um, quite a bit less regulated. The other thing I will say about um, this content is that a lot of it is pro weight loss. And even though we might not, a lot of people might not see that as pro eating disorder content, um, and it might not have even been included in those studies, pro weight loss content, um, like weight loss ads, we're talking about Noom, we're talking about Weight Watchers, those are being sent to people, like Lisa said, that are very vulnerable, um, that specifically are going to likely feel something about that. And then, like Stephanie said, feeling like they need to reach this higher level of um, social one-upness, um, that thinness is a value in our society and that in order to be more valuable or be seen as more valuable, that we need to be thinner and therefore lose weight, no matter what size you are. Um, so all of this is kind of the melting pot, the, as we like to say, the perfect storm that um, is also added to everything else that we're experiencing with our peers. Um, and it's, it's a lot to go through. So that was what I had. Thank you, Serena. Um, I think you're right. It, it is the perfect storm. And when it comes down to hearing those statistics about you know, millions of dollars being, being spent on this, it can seem overwhelming of what what can we do? What are we doing? And so many of you are, are doing the work to to combat this. And um, I think one thing that a few of you have, have already brought up and that I'd like to talk about is, is how do we, obviously, um, social media and technology is not going away. It's only getting bigger. And it seems like Every time, every year, there's a new platform. You know, we have threads coming out now and Discord and different things becoming bigger and bigger. So we, it's, it's at the point where we can't simply tell you to not go online and to not engage in this content. And they're being fed the content um, willingly or not. And so um, how can we get, make the, the online space safer? And, you know, what suggestions do you have for um, ways that social media can can be helpful to body image, to eating problems, to um, self esteem for young people? Whether that's things that that they can do themselves, or different things that we can advocate for as individuals. I'm happy to jump in. Um, I have been an advocate online for quite a few years, um, very grassroots, small, but um, there are some formal ways and some informal ways that uh, social media can be helpful and that we can protect ourselves um, and, and our kids. Um, I, for, you know, with, as far as protecting um, our communities, there is a, uh, a bill, a federal bill that is in place called the Kids Online Safety Act. Um, I see Sophie nodding, so I'm gonna let uh, them share more about that if that's what they were gonna talk about. Um, but it is a bill that is hopefully going to allow um, parents to have more of a uh, an option to play a role in protecting their kids on specifically on social media sites. So um, I'm in the middle of actually reading the full bill um, and it's, it's talk, it's really giving opportunities for parents to go on the sites and make specific changes and settings to protect people. Um, so that's one of the things that we can do as a society on a, on a more macro level. Um, individually, I really want to talk about like how important social media can be. Um, personally, as someone in a large body, I identify as a fat person. Um, I also identify as a queer person. We talk about the positives of social media being that you find community. I um, grew up in a larger body. I didn't know that there was this whole movement um, that that is talking about body image and body liberation and fat people and just existing in your body as you are. Um, 
and acknowledging as well the systemic issues that we're all that we're facing in larger bodies. Um, and so that has been more harmful, or sorry, more helpful than harmful. Um, as far as social media, I don't think I ever would have found that community without social media. Um, and it has allowed me to find not only a place where I can personally feel accepted and loved, um, and but also has allowed me to help other people. Um, and I do trainings on weight stigma and fat phobia all because of social media. Um, and as well as, of course, the elders and the people who uh, founded the movement, uh, specifically women of color. Um, so I think being also a queer person, I know um, queer youth and queer, um, queer adults as well find a lot of safety um, and comfort and community in some online spaces. Um, and so there are definitely some positives to social media. Um, but I'm wondering, Sophie, do you have more to say on COSA? Yeah, I was actually going to speak on COSA and more specifically on the state level advocacy in California on SB 680, because um, that's the one I've done a little bit of more work on. But COSA, I can kind of give a general overview. Essentially, it's meant to protect kids online and create a little bit more transparency with the social media algorithms. So a lot of that would look like internal audits and giving state attorney generals the right to kind of hold social media companies accountable. Um, and there is a large ongoing debate as to how much of this falls on parents versus how much of this falls on the social media platforms themselves. And that is a note I kind of want to emphasize out there because there are some bills out there that kind of say, okay, we're going to give parents like a little bit more transparency as to their kids' social media usage. That can be a huge issue for queer youth, especially with families that aren't super accepting. So I will go on the record saying, I believe it is the social media platforms that need to be held accountable for this. It's unfair to task already stressed out, overworked parents with keeping their kids completely safe online in platforms that they don't understand and didn't grow up with. I think it's unfair to parents and it's unfair to kids. Um, so what SB 680 in California does is it's a model in which, um, again, it would be up to state the state legislator to hold social media platforms accountable uh, monetarily for violating um, any young person by showing them harmful content um, and it requires them to perform monthly internal audits to make sure that their platforms are as safe as possible for young people um, and that is a safe house provision if they perform those audits they are not liable to the penalties but if they don't and then young people are out there saying I developed an eating disorder because um, I was exposed to this content and therefore I was able to engage in these behaviors I haven't been exposed to before. Um, those social media companies can be held accountable um, financially. Um, so I've done a lot of work on that bill. I'd be happy to drop some more information on that as well. Um, but yeah, something else I wanted to mention is again, we is very important to talk about the positive sides of social media because it is not going to go away. And I think that the most positive asset that social media has had for me and for so many fellow young advocates is it is a platform to build solidarity with other young people where we have not been able to before, especially for more marginalized young folks that often do not have communities in person. Being able to find a community online, being able to put language to an experience that we may have not had before is so powerful. I may have never realized that I was queer without seeing that representation online, without seeing that on social media. I can speak uh, with so many young people that have had that same experience. And that is especially important for marginalized bodies that are silenced in the media. We do not see enough fat representation in media. We don't see it in TV. We don't see it in magazines. We don't see it in books. The only place that I've come across that has been on social media. And it's such an important space for people who have been marginalized to be able to connect to each other, to build solidarities, and to work together to change systems to be more fair and equitable. Um, that is very possible, but that is also being stifled by algorithms that, again, are silencing content that is coming from marginalized creators. So there is just so much work and unpacking that needs to be done to hold these social media companies accountable in both ensuring that they don't harm youth by showing them blatantly harmful content, but also making it equitable for creators that have been um, historically marginalized.
wanted to add, Jackie, you know, I think when we're thinking about social media, it, it, I don't know about the rest of, of, the, of the folks um, with us today, but, you know, as a parent myself and uh, to a preteen and, and thinking about how to navigate some of these things, it, it can so quickly feel so huge that it, you can very quickly feel helpless for how, how are we to support young people around this. Um, as a day-to-day -day matter, I think it, absolutely uh, legislation like COSA in Minnesota with all is working to support a piece of legislation to, to um, make sure that some of the algorithms that can be so particularly harmful to young people are, not, not, um, are no longer allowed. Um, so these things are very, very important. But I think as a day-to-day -day matter, it's asking ourselves, you know, what can we each do? Um, I think it really is important to back up a little bit out of social media first, so then you can head into social media. And what I mean by that is for all of us adults to be aware of the harms of appearance overvaluing, right? When we're overvaluing appearance, to be aware of how that is everywhere, it's not hard to find, and really question it ourselves to start to start to make different choices perhaps, or, or, or to underscore our choices around how our bodies are not about how they look, our bodies are how they feel and what they can do. And really, really understanding that that's so key for kids to develop positive body image. Similarly with diet culture, <clears throat> starting to be really aware of the ways in which diet culture is all around us. Again, unfortunately, it's not hard to find. Seeing how do we all contribute to that? How are we each in our own way furthering diet culture, growing diet culture. So then we can start to look at how can we create the spaces in our day-to-day -day life to protect the kids that are growing in those spaces? How are, how am I as a parent going to refuse that I'm not going to overvalue appearance? As I'm talking about my own body, my child's body, the bodies I see on TV, other people's bodies, how am I not going to endorse diet culture? Talking about food as a moral issue when it's food, right? then I think we can start to think about how does that then apply to what we're going to do as role models, parents, teachers, pediatricians, other, other role models with kids. And I think things like, first off, this, this is something I think is so important, teaching kids about questioning what they see, questioning images they see, telling them about the real world context behind what they see. You know, the one bright spot of COVID, too much television watching was a lot of commercials, right? And and talking to my daughter about marketing, like why why are they saying this instead of that, right? And and they're they're trying to sell us something, right? And then similarly, I think um, just teaching them about fake images. This is going to become a really big deal really really soon. It already is, but it's going to blow up, right? With artificial intelligence, teaching them that's not real. And then when you see certain models and some other things what goes on, what's the context around that very, very perfect seeming image we see, right? Um, more of the story so kids are aware when they see that. Um, and then I'll just end with, I think the Surgeon General's report on uh, youth and social media and the harms um, mental health. I think that there were some solid recommendations in there for, you know, creating family media plan with boundaries and rules and um, tech-free zone and really trying to promote in-person engagement as much as possible. I would echo what a lot of um, panelists said already. I do think, um, you know, social media is a great place to find community um, in person. Oftentimes, um, we're not as open. We're not as sharing as much as maybe we are online. And so it might be easier online to find someone who is, is similar to you that maybe even you know or see at school or somewhere else, but you didn't have that conversation and you can align with folks a little bit better. Maybe bring some of that into, into real life as well. Um, I think. Uh, fat acceptance communities are a great way to balance some of the other messages that that youth are seeing. Um, the difficulty can be that sometimes they are hard to find. Um, I am in reco in recovery. I am in a larger body, and um, I struggled with that for a long time. Um, before one day, I just started searching how to be fat and happy. It sounds really simple and really silly, um, but I was not receiving any content online related to being in a larger body and being okay with it or being happy with it. Um, and so it's it is harder to find because it it isn't it isn't being pushed to you like others others have said, um, and I think it uh, social media platforms can be a way to see representation of more bodies that look like yours. But then what happens 
when your body's still not being represented. Um, there is a greater variety of bodies being represented online, but it can still be hard to always find those. Um, and sometimes what the problem is still is that it's still highlighting that our body is the most important thing about us. Um, and there's, there's still some challenges and, and issues um, with that. As far as making online platforms safer, I think the acts mentioned already are important, but if you go to uh, the Eating Disorder Coalition frequently post about legislation um, that's happening nationwide and statewide related to eating disorders, including um, you know, different online safety acts and, and that kind of thing. Um, the, from a developmental psychology standpoint, um, the research on parental monitoring of electronic devices and platforms um, is a little mixed as to whether or not um, it's actually preventing any harm or whether it's causing more difficulty with the parent-child relationship um, and, and that kind of thing. I would never tell a parent that not to monitor their, child, their social child's devices if that's the thing they need to do. They know their child best in most cases. Um, but I would have more of a stronger emphasis, like Lisa said, on the conversations that you're having um, with your kids. And I will often, when I'm viewing my own social media, my kids are in earshot, I will say things like, well, I think I've had enough of this. I'm starting not to feel great about myself. Or I will kind of verbalize the process that I go through when I choose to change the channel or shut off something so that they can, I can model that, model that for them. Um, and I think also, um, these can't be one and done conversations. They need to be ongoing, just like they would be about anything else that we find important, whether it's sex education, mental health awareness, stranger danger. You don't have the conversation once and then then drop it. It's it's something that you do continually have because I, I do think the social media companies do need to be held liable. But while that's still happening, my kids are still in real life online and engaging in things online. And so we do limit some of their time online, but then also talking to them, like I said, about, about what they're viewing. Um, there's some great question posed in uh, Lindsay and Lexi Kite's book, More Than a Body, that I think can be beneficial when you're talking about viewing um, your content. You want to be asking yourself and your kids asking themselves, does this content make me feel better or worse about myself? You know, who profits from these messages? Um, who's advertising these pages that I'm visiting? You know, you'll see ads on top of influencers' pages. That's, that's who's paying for that content. Um, does this encourage me to fixate on my own or others' appearances? Um, and does it promote or uh, reinforce distorted ideals of what faces and bodies should look like um, are really, really important too. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, thank you to all of our speakers. I think there were so many tangible items that we can pull from what each of you shared as, as adults, as parents, as people who work with youth, whatever um, you're joining us with in, in your role as today as our audience members, and just emphasizing those conversations and that modeling. I agree, Lisa and Stephanie, it's so important the way that we um, talk about bodies and food and, and image has such an impact on what then that youth carries into their beliefs throughout their lifetime. And I saw a few comments in the chat, you know, addressing that. How do we work with, with youth who have had this, this trauma in the past of the way that they're spoken to or spoken about and the beliefs they have? And it's so real. So thank you for bringing that up and just the importance of your language, how you talk about um, individuals and that, that the way you look isn't the most important thing about yourself in the least um, and really ingraining that in, in youth at a young age. So thank you all for that. Um, I know we're, our, our time is flying by here together. But one area that I'd, I'd love to get into, and I know that this part can be hard because we're going to be talking about specific types of content that might be dangerous or harmful out there. But I've seen a few questions like this in the chat too, um, regarding, you know, when we're talking about harmful material to youth that's out there, what does that really mean? And what does that look like? And what should we be looking out for? And what are some warning signs that our kids are being fed? harmful or dangerous material. So um, I'd love to just hear from each of you uh, if, if you'd like to share for what parents and adults um, can, can look out for, what are some of the harmful things online 
that youth are able to access around body image, eating, eating disorders, um, and and really what signs parents and, and adults can look for that youth are engaging in that or, or seeing. Um, well, this is definitely not my complete expertise, so I would definitely rely on the other panelists as well. But um, when I think about pro eating disorder content, I think about content that elevates eating less um, or restricting um, and uh, to a really great degree. Um, like I think of more of the extreme stuff. Um, I think of pro anorexia content. Um, if I think about my age group, like Tumblr esque, like pages that are specifically related to pro anorexia that show photos um, and almost how to guides of how to engage in an eating disorder to become thinner. Um, we have to acknowledge that eating disorders are usually off are often um, not just about what someone looks like and maybe not even at all, uh, but sometimes but how they are often perpetuated online is uh, talked about um, of, of how how we look. Um, and um, I heard I read an article recently. There's a great article about um, how people are. Um, going around and using loopholes. Uh, so we think about hashtags, the hashtags eating disorder um, and ED, like those things are regulated. Um, if you try to use that hashtag on TikTok, uh, a little like notification pops up with resources and it's great. And I've heard that people are using the hashtag uh, Ed Sheeran as an ED Sheeran because it completely like you get around it and then you're able to connect with the people that you want to connect with. Um, I think a lot of the time these pro eating disorder content is like trying to find community and like, like, you know, I don't know, I'm going through this or I like this. I like the attention I'm getting from how I am looking, how I like the attention I'm getting from being thinner or how I'm being treated or like, tell me more about how you do this, like just to discover. So um, it's, for me, it's all about community and storytelling. And that's like the root of it, even though it's coming from like a harmful, it ends up being harmful. Like people are just like, I think, um, kind of desperate to find people who are, are like them. Um, I'll start with that and let others. Thanks for going first on that, Serena. Um, Jackie, I had thought about this question and it, it's gonna be unsatisfactory, my answer at best. Uh, it, it, I, I would go ahead and submit that any social media that's, pro that's promoting even tacitly, right? over over valuing appearance, which is so much of social media. I'm just gonna, you know, maybe I'm showing my generation here. I don't know. Um, over valuing appearance and promoting and furthering the diet culture, the idea that, you know, we need to eat a certain way. We need to restrict these things. We need it. so much of social media is that, right? I think it's harmful to all of us, um, but I think it's particularly, particularly it's very, very dangerous for a lot of young people, you know? And um, certainly I think the other layer, the other level is the stuff that Serena just spoke into. I mean, then we're just like, wow. Um, now we're promoting, actually promoting eating disorders like openly. Um, <clears throat> and then one thing I'll say that I think is, it's kind of thrown me a little bit as I read the Washington Post article in the last week or so, I think it was about artificial intelligence and related to eating disorders. And um, it's, I think it's really, really scary because they, they were talking as one example, and this is how I, how I took it in at least. Um, when you're putting into you know, a chat bot and saying, you know, give me a diet to lose weight or give me that, what can come back, what is coming back looks very medical, 
right? For me, who's had an experience with an eating disorder and and also, you know, tries to live healthy, I think that can be really terrifying because now it looks like it's very, very professional, very medical, very, and I think there's enough confusion about that out there already. Like what advice is actual solid medical advice versus someone in their basement making stuff up? Um, and I think that's just going to get worse and worse, the confusion around that. As I was reviewing these questions, I, I had a similar thought to you, Lisa, like my response is not going to be very satisfactory um, because I think it can really depend. Um, I agree, like wherever that culture is being pushed um, is certainly harmful. I think it can sneak in in, in sneaky ways, though, just kind of as an example, um, both my sons uh, really enjoy basketball as, as fans and as athletes. And during the NBA finals, they were watching, you know, YouTube highlights on the games and stuff like sh shouldn't be a place for, you wouldn't think any eating disorder um, and content, um, but they happened to be watching something on YouTube and in my presence. And it started talking about one of the players started engaging in cutting out of whole food groups and specific or exercise routines. And so, you know, we immediately shut it off and started talking about, you know, why that content wasn't helpful for them. And and why, why um, you know, when athletes are doing things, it's under medical supervision. And we had to have kind of a discussion about that too. And we had to talk more about, you know, if you are watching something and this stuff starts coming in telling you how you need to treat your body to be an athlete, you know, we, we need to talk about that and, and how that moves forward. So I think, you know, if diet culture can creep into kids' specific interest areas that maybe aren't as flagged or as obvious, as some of the the, the uh, examples Serena presented. And so I think, again, like it's, it's not entirely on the parents to control social media, but I think it is important to still have conversations about what they might find, what, what they find interesting and then be aware of where that triggering content may be kind of spliced in things that maybe would seem, seem innocent enough. Yeah, I really want to echo the framework that everyone used. I don't think my answer will be satisfactory because I'm going to be very frank in saying that I think the entire diet and fitness industry in this moment is harmful and that is everywhere. So harmful content is quite frankly everywhere. So it is really hard for me to define, especially because one young person could look at content and be completely unaffected. Yes, it is harmful as a systemic issue, but they can go on and live their lives. If they do not have the genetic makeup to develop an eating disorder, they simply won't. What does happen though, is that there is an environmental factor to eating disorders. So someone may have the genetics and it will take one specific triggering piece of language, one specific triggering image to send that young person down a spiral. And I cannot define that for each and every young person. Um, as Serena mentioned, there is some content that is explicitly harmful. The how-to di uh, diet guides that we saw on Tumblr in 2014 are absolutely resurfacing on TikTok. We are seeing diet and starvation guides that if a young person were to follow unabashedly, they would likely end up in a very horrible medical situation. Um, and that's very unfortunate. And that is content that absolutely needs to be abolished. Um, but we are seeing it creep up in more and more sneaky ways. We are seeing it creep up in more subtle ways as well. Um, so just one of the signs that I look for in young people in general, and this is just like a pretty good rule of thumb that I would say for monitoring young people's social media usage is how they interact with peers in the real world. Building communities online can be a great thing. It can be a positive experience. It can lead one to learn and discover. It can help democratize information. Uh, but once it gets to a point where it is preventing young people from creating meaningful in-person connections, that is harmful. And it is very, very isolating to constantly scroll and come across this harmful content that you cannot find in the real world, that you cannot find in your day-to-day -day conversations. Um, and I can speak from experience and I can speak from witnessing this happening to my peers. When a young person is engaging with content that is harmful to them online, they spend more hours doing it because harmful content is addictive. So as soon as you see a young person become socially withdrawn, um, more so than is usual for them. I would say that is, I mean, a big red flag for many different things, but especially in today's culture and today's climate, it is a red flag for harmful social media content um, and interactions with that. I'd love to just add one more thing. Um, 
a couple things on Sophie's point. Um, one of the ways that I never got, a, I never, as far as I know, got a clinical uh, eating disorder, but disordered eating, uh, which is kind of our term for you experienced, you know, your relationship with food was complicated and you overate um, or you binged during certain sometimes or you underate during sometimes. Um, I definitely experienced that. And specifically in high school, um, thinking about the withdrawing, I definitely withdrew like socially. But um, specifically, I chose to get a granola bar for lunch and take it to the library and work on homework because I was a good student. Um, and looking back, and I didn't, and I, that, that was me socially um, withdrawing. I didn't want to be in the lunchroom. I didn't feel comfortable there. People were mean, um, even if they weren't like outwardly mean. And so I think, and then, but like when I was in class, I was super engaged. I had some friends, I had after school activities, but I think about how much parents and guardians don't know about kids' lunches. Um, and, and I think it's important to ask questions in ways that are like, what did you have for lunch? Like kind of just engaging in the topic. I'm not a parent, so I'm not sure which way is best, but my parents never asked me. And I look back and I'm like, well, for a whole year, I ate a granola bar for lunch like that could that's like missing a whole meal um and that's really harmful and also like I still don't feel like valid in my disordered eating like I wouldn't sit like so I think that's interesting um and then the other thing specifically with online content um as well as in-person content is this focus on weight loss um weight loss ads weight loss organizations companies are spending so much money on ads, um, as well as the new um, weight loss drugs, uh, which are actually supposed to be, you know, medically used for people who have diabetes and other medical issues. Um, and thinking about like, I have tons of, I have friends in New York who like are on in the subway and there's huge Ozempic ads, will go the ads with like the little um, syringe situation. Um, and that comes up on social media as well, just like constantly in the news talking about um, the new weight loss ads. And for me, that is very critical. And if I had been in the state that I was in as a child and found out about that and knew uh, my parents, if my parents knew that like oh, the Academy for uh, American Academy for Pediatrics says it's OK to give these people like give kids this then I I maybe I would have wanted that and maybe I would have gotten it at any means I don't know um so I think we need to keep having conversations about it, it does all go back to what Lisa and Stephanie were talking about of like this thin ideal why do we have it how is does it keep getting perpetuated um I'll leave it there thank you Serena Thank you all. I know we're we're so close to our end time and I just want to thank you all. I know it's been um, a really important conversation to have and I appreciate you all for, for sharing your experiences and knowledge with us here today. Um, I know we have a, like exactly one minute, but I want us to leave on a positive um, note. And so I'd love just like a sentence or one or two from each speaker on one way that you're currently taking care of your body and mind um, that can encourage those listening and that they can encourage in the youth around them. I know for me, it's been intentional movement and movement that makes me feel happy and um, engaging in, in movement, not as a punishment, but as a joy. I'm spending my time with, oh, go ahead. Please, Stephanie. I'm spending more time with my animals. Um, I had read somewhere that like petting your dog for seven to eight minutes a day can lower your blood pressure. Um, I don't have high blood pressure, but uh, it's certainly stress relieving to spend time with my dogs, not scrolling my phone while I'm petting them. I'm, I'm learning about the joys of breathing deeply and intentionally. It's, it's always shocking when I do that, how good it feels. And I am really trying to do it regularly. 
I've been setting boundaries with family members who have been violating my boundaries for many years. And it's hard, but good. We love to hear it. I can close with an affirmation that I tell myself, um, loving my larger body shouldn't have to be radical, but it is, and that's okay. Thank you for that, Sophie. And thank you all again, um, just for your knowledge, your openness, your willingness to share this space with us today. And thank you all for joining, for sharing your experiences in the chat, your knowledge. Um, Just a reminder to everyone, that we will be um, sending out this recording along with a lot of the resources that each of our speakers talked about today and our um, MHA back to school toolkit that will be released on Tuesday. So you can expect to receive um, the follow-up email coming out early next week with all of this. And um, please join us for the other events that we have planned for the rest of August and September that have this youth focus. So. Thank you all. Thank you, Lisa, Stephanie, Sophie, and Serena. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day and weekend. Thank you all.